Now I want to talk about a deep sea food web that I actually started out studying when I was an undergraduate at the University of Washington and I went to USC as a graduate student with hopes of studying this deep sea food web but somehow I got sent back up to the top of the photic zone and was never able to study, never engaged in studies of the organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean, but they are still one of my favorite organisms or favorite ecosystems, the kinds of things that live in the very deep waters and the deep muds and in the deep trenches of the sea of the seafloor, and that would be the deep sea benthic food webs. If you think about the deep sea benthos, it's really one of the most extreme environments we'll find for organisms here on Earth. It's cold, it's dark, it's under crushing pressure, it has very little food. Any food that it does have is food that, again, rains down from above after it's been processed by the midwater food webs. Um, but surprisingly, despite these very harsh conditions, the deep sea benthos is extremely diverse. And partly that has to do with the fact that the environment itself is very diverse. We have soft bottom habitats. Those uh, oozes that we talked about in chapter 5, those very rich sediments and sometimes organic filled sediments um, that we find at the bottom of the ocean. The abyssal hills and the abyssal plains that we talked about in chapter 4. Hard bottom habitats, rocky um, habitats such as seamounts or oceanic ridges, uh, oceanic trenches where rocks are exposed, submarine canyons, hydrothermal vents, and cold seeps. All of these are deep sea benthic environments and in all of these types of environments we find deep sea benthic food webs. Well here's an example of one that we've talked about uh, in chapter 3 we talked about hydrothermal vents. We mentioned them a little bit in chapter 4. Uh, we talked about them in chapter 13 when we talked about chemoautotrophs. This is a hydrothermal vent ecosystem and again all the details here are probably beyond what we want to know for our purposes in the class, but if you take a look at each of these components and think about predator-prey relationships, if you think about sources of food and those kinds of things, it's really the kinds of stuff that we've already talked about in the class. Of course, the key um, process that goes on at hydrothermal vents is the release of the chemicals from the superheated water and the release of these hydrogen sulfides and other chemicals which may be used by bacteria as an energy source and as an energy source then these bacteria either grow freely so free living bacteria or even as symbiotic bacteria living in the tissues of many hydrothermal vent organisms it's the bacteria then feeding off these hydrogen sulfides and chemicals that are coming out of the vents that are, the, are a type of primary producer. So though midwater food webs are completely absent in terms of their primary producers, hydrothermal vents, because of this hot vent activity, have their own source of primary producers in the form of chemoautotrophs. Of course, bacteria may be eaten um, by a number of different organisms. Really, they may be eaten, uh, flocks of them may be fed upon by different kinds of um, crustacean zooplankton, but as well as the microbial food web that we talked about before. Suspension feeders like clams may take, it, um, take in those bacteria and eat them. And of course we have predators that feed on the things that are feeding on the bacteria and a whole host of different relationships that go on in terms of predator-prey interactions. Now, one of the surprises, I think, uh, at least for me, in terms of hydrothermal vents, is that they don't depend entirely on chemoautotrophs. And we need to keep this in mind, and there's some debate in the hydrothermal vent scientific community as to how much energy and matter are actually supplied by chemoautotrophic activities. It turns out that there's quite a bit of material, at least relatively speaking, that also comes down from above and photosynthetically derived organic material. Again, that rain of carbon from above, and even if it's a small percentage of the total amount that's produced in the upper ocean, some of it makes its way down to the seafloor, and here it can be processed by different kinds of organisms that can feed upon that material, and then they can be fed upon organisms that are feeding on that material, and so on and so forth. One other important aspect of hydrothermal vent ecosystems is that they're temporary. 
temporary in the sense that they may only last for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe longer, maybe shorter, but they will only survive and persist as long as a hydrothermal vent is active. And we know from the process of seafloor spreading, maybe about the rate at which your fingernail grows, that those plates are moving apart. And eventually those hydrothermal vents that were once right on top of an oceanic ridge, eventually those hydrothermal vents will be moved away from the ridge. And then the hydrothermal vent will go extinct. And when it goes extinct, well, then all this activity goes down. We don't have the abundance of life that we normally find associated with hydrothermal vents. And we have really a, then a deep sea benthic habitat, just like most of the deep ocean, that's not supplied by hydrothermal vent. So, temporary kind of ecosystem. Well, another interesting type of ecosystem, and again, this would be a transitional ecosystem, one that uh, comes about only episodically, but this one is supplied by the carcasses of large organisms. And should you ever fall over at sea and unfortunately sink to the bottom, or if you think about the bodies of dead sailors that sink to the bottom, you can rest assured that your body will be well used by the organisms that live at the bottom of the ocean, just like a carcass of, say, a blue whale might be used. And these sulfophilic communities, uh, a rich community of organisms that colonizes um, these, the bones and carcasses of, of dead organisms, is a relatively new discovery. And an amazing discovery is that the kinds of organisms we find on this, these types of uh, communities, the dead carcasses of organisms, particularly large organisms like whales, can be found nowhere else in the ocean. They're unique and endemic to um, the carcasses of dead organisms that float to the bottom of the ocean. So we have a lot of food webs that are somewhat surprising in some ways. Just even the carcass of an organism can uh, create a food web. But it really talks to the strategies of organisms and the evolution of life and the uh, ability of life to take advantage of whatever it's given. Um, in this case, a large dead whale.